Hi, and thanks for finding this room. It was so remote. Did you, you know, it took a while to just even get here. So thank you very much. I'm Teresa Newell, and um, uh, I'm delighted to see you, and uh, I'm very excited about this topic today, and I'm sorry we can't get the PowerPoint up. However, if you do have the app, the new Wineskins app, it is on the app. Uh, so if you want to look at some pictures while I'm talking, that's, that, that, go for it. Uh, there are handouts, or uh, there were some handouts out there that look like this, which is just kind of a little outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, our topic, as you know, is why Israel matters biblically. Um, and I wanted to mention, I'm, I'm, I, this, is, this is my little show and tell up here, uh, for those that can't see it, but I have a little prayer shawl from Jerusalem up here in the front. Uh, and there are a couple of books that I wanted to mention to you um, that I didn't put on the sheet. But uh, one is, uh, I, I, Jerry, uh, Dr. Gerald McDermott uh, knows that I plagiarized his title. Why, uh, this is, his book is called Israel Matters. And I told him that I was using Why Israel Matters. But I do recommend this book, and it's at our CMJ uh, USA uh, table for the same price you'd get it at Amazon. So uh, if you can find our table down that first hall where the exhibits are, that will book will be there. And it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really great book to, because Jerry is an, an Anglican priest. He's head of the Anglican uh, Studies Department at Beeson Divinity School in Birmingham, Alabama, which happens to be my hometown. Um, and this is his really book to tell his testimony on how he came to understand Israel from a biblical perspective um, and how he had sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater uh, on Israel because he was not a premillennial dispensationalist. And he didn't know what to do with that, so he just kind of forgot it. And then it kind of came back, and he's made many trips to Israel also. So he, he, he just began to really deal with that. Uh, for himself, and and he, and it's a good personal sort of testimony, but also some good theology and biblical stuff. So that book. Now, if you want to be really academic, we don't have this book at our uh, at our table, but it's also it's edited by, by Jerry McDermott. It's called the New Christian Zionism, and uh, this was a product of some more uh, some quite academic. Uh, talks and essays that were given at an uh, Institute for Religion and Democracy uh, seminar in 2015 in Washington, D.C. It's a very interesting book to read with great footnotes and all kinds of things if you want to go there. And then um, a new book that just came out, and I just picked it up at our Lausanne Consultation on Jewish Evangelism International Conference by my friend Dr. Randall Price, who taught at Liberty College. And this is a compilation of, I think, about 32 or 35 essays uh, on what should we think about Israel. And it comes at it from every kind of, they're short essays, easy to read, but hit a lot of the major topics. I'm mentioning all this because we've got 15 minutes, and obviously there's a lot to talk about. So these are follow-ups. The last one I want to mention is <clears throat> The Origins of Christian Zionism. Uh, and the subtitle is Lord Shaftesbury and Evangelical Support for a Jewish Homeland by uh, Dr. Don Lewis, who is a professor of church history at Regent College, Vancouver. Uh, this is basically a history, a 19th century history of CMJ. Uh, Lord Shaftesbury was the um, uh, chairman of CMJ in England for 50 years. Uh, so he's, he's telling his story, basically, but it's really the story of CMJ. So I just wanted to mention these things because I think uh, for most of us in uh, evangelical Anglican churches, um, the topic of Israel and uh, why does it matter uh, gets a, a very uh, short shrift. I mean, you don't always get a lot of teaching on that issue. So I think it's important that we look at it biblically, uh, not politically, not whatever. I mean, there are a lot of ways that you can look at Israel, obviously. And many of us, there's some people in this room that we just came back like two days ago from Israel doing one of our CMJ Shorish uh, study tours. So let's go back, let's go to the outline. And, uh, and I'm going to go quickly about, I thought it was interesting last night that our major speaker, wasn't that the most energetic 
Burundi talk you ever heard in your life. Um, I just talked to him. This, he happened to be sitting behind me this morning in, in the in the uh, session this morning, and we happened to have a team from our church that go repeatedly into Burundi to set up electrical systems, uh, f uh, generators, and that sort of thing. And they're there now. So I was so excited when he said Burundi, because many of us, some of us were in uh, Rwanda just after the genocide, and and uh, and it was all tied together because those countries are just next to each other. So uh, he started with Abraham. Well, that's the great place to start. I often say when I do, I've been doing Jewish mission for 45 years now. I opened the first American office for CMJ in the United States in about 1980 out of Truro Church in Fairfax. Yay, let's hear it for Truro. Um, Yes, it was back to John Howe days in those days, okay? So, um, yes, John was my, my rector for 13 years, I think. So, um, so uh, the, I often say when I'm doing Jewish mission, I'm talking to rabbis even, that they often go back to, they tend to go back to Moses, but they forget about Abraham, and really they need to go back to Abraham <laughs> because there's the beginning um, uh, and there's the grace message uh, in Abraham, because God looked on his on him with in uh, you know Genesis 15:6, famous. Uh, uh, he, he believed God, and God looked upon him as righteous. So um, Paul goes back to that, obviously. So I was glad he started with Abraham last night, and he got a great teaching and a great application out of that. So I put first of all Abraham, Abraham uh, 12 are the promises, those 12 promises, uh, the seven promises he was talking about last night. Uh, but you get to 15, which is where the actual unconditional land promises uh, to Abram and all of his descendants comes in. So we have to take that seriously because that's God making an unconditional promise. And uh, so, so this is something we really have to hold in our mind. And and unfortunately, over the church age in the last 2,000 years, uh, through various uh, errant theologies, of, this has been written out, and it's come through many ways. And so I mentioned a few things here, that uh, there is the, the land has been a real issue for, uh, for the church. The, is the land really belonging to the descendants of Abraham? Uh, but and so is it a real promise or is it just allegorical and we know that in the early church uh, the Bible began to be read allegorically especially with Augustine and we won't go into that but you can read it and look it up in fact there's a whole big book I have on Augustine and the Jews and it'll tell you all about what uh, what Augustine concluded uh, about the Jews but there was also even before Augustine uh, Justin Martyr came along and he has uh, uh, written a whole bunch of things, uh, but he was the first one in the second century to use the phrase uh, the, that Israel was the, the church, the new Israel. The church was the new Israel. It wrote out all of, of, of biological Jews. It wrote out the land. It wrote out a lot of things because everything got relegated then to the church. All it was often said that all the promises got relegated to the church and all the curses got relegated to the Jews, and they're set into into early church history, what I call theological anti-Semitism, when the Jews began to be accused of being the Christ killers, and I can tell you that people, Jewish people my age who've come to faith in Jesus, could all tell you testimonies that even when they were in the fifth grade in their grade school in New Jersey, they were called Christ killers. And they didn't understand what that meant. They'd have to go home and say, you know, Mom, Dad, what do they mean by that? Um, so, so I think it's important, very important for us in the church today, biblically literate people, to look at the Bible and really ask what it's saying. Is land real or is it just allegorical? The, and I put in some of these notes. The geographical land of Israel appears over 1,000 times, 70 times in Deuteronomy alone. Uh, it, that, and then I have a couple of quotes here, uh, from one from a Bible scholar. All of, of all the promises made to the patriarchs, it was that of the land that was most prominent and decisive. 
And then McDermott himself says 70% of places where covenant appears, we make a lot out of covenant. But land is mentioned always in terms of the covenant because that was the unconditional covenant uh, for the land. The prophets pick that up. I always say when I'm teaching classes um, that you've got to know Torah. You've got to know the first five books. If you know the first five books, which we tend to avoid, unfortunately, if you know the first five books, the rest is just commentary, including the New Testament. What did Jesus and the Jewish apostles, Paul, everybody, have except the Hebrew scriptures? So what are they quoting from, <laughs> you know, but the Hebrew scriptures? Uh, so what happens when we get to the prophets and the writings and the history uh, of the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, what we have is everybody's talking about the land again because what's happening? If you're not obeying the law, you're going out of the land. But one of the things that I find really in intriguing, what is it, Psalm 24 says, that, uh, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Well, we know that everything belongs to the Lord. Anybody disagree with that? <laughs> everything belongs to the Lord. But he can decide who he wants to give it to. Amen. Okay? Now, I have one of my slides, if you, if you get the slides, is I have a little map of Israel. And Israel is like nothing. I mean, I mean serious. I mean, you know when they were showing those global things, you know? Um, it's like the size of New Jersey, maybe. And it's, uh, it, 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 it's like, why did God choose that little piece of real estate? I don't know, but I know he chose it. He made it clear. And he even gave dimensions of where it was supposed to be. And they were real dimensions. They weren't allegorical. You know, they were talking about real rivers, you know, Mediterranean Sea, you know, this real. So, okay, now what are, the, what are the prophets talking about as they go through their time? They're saying, you're out of the land if you're not doing what God's, if you're not living the godly life, according to Torah. Uh, unfortunately, Deuteronomy 28, you know, it says, if you do this, great, you get blessings. If you do this, oops, out you go. But God never changed his mind about who the land he was, had given it to. Because he said over and over and over again, read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, read Ezekiel. You are coming back. You are going out because I want you to learn a lesson. No more idolatry. Enough idolatry already. Okay, but, but you're going to come back. I'm going to promise you the land, and you're coming back. Now, one of the things that strikes us, I've been going to Israel for like 45 years now, and I can tell you that from what I can read in the New Testament, Jerusalem was never greater and more beautiful and more built up than in the time of Jesus. One generation later, kaboom, uh, the Romans come, and it's gone. 70 AD, final uh, revolu uh, revolt against Rome, uh, 135 to 137 with Bar Kokhba, gone. Jews are sent out of the land and forbidden to come back. But today, Jerusalem is more beautiful and more built up than since the days of Jesus. Now, you can do whatever you want to with that, but that's a fact. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there it is. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit uh, in this little short time about some of the history of CMJ and what the people in 1809, the early 19th century, were thinking because the, the Scottish Puritans had started to come back with this idea that maybe Romans 9, 10, and 11 wasn't just an afterthought or a little sermon that Paul just stuck in his briefcase and pulled out and said, oh, yeah, this would be a good place to put that. No, the new scholarship on Romans, actually, and I'm glad we're doing Romans in, this, in our Bible readings, is that the whole centrality of Romans uh, was about the Jews. Paul is asking God with great anguish in his heart, and those are strong Greek words there, great anguish, what is, why aren't my Jewish people coming? And he got, he, God answered that prayer, and whatever the Holy Spirit told him, we got the advantage of being able to read it in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And what was his conclusion? God's not finished with the Jewish people. <laughs> The church had written the Jewish people out, but God's not finished from the scriptures. He's not finished with the Jewish people. Paul says, no, the falling away of the Jews, it has two marks to it. It's both temporary, that is, there's a coming, a time, when, and it is partial. It's partial because he says, look, I'm a Jew. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. 
and, and all the early church was Jewish. And so it wasn't a complete wipeout of the Jews that they didn't come to know Jesus. But, there, but it was slow going, and he saw how the Gentiles, and then he concludes this. You Gentiles, you have been let in because God is so merciful to you that he's sort of setting his Jewish people aside just for a moment. And because a year is, a thousand years is like a, a day for the Lord. Uh, setting them aside so that you, all the nations of the world can come in. And then all Israel will be saved. Now see, that's the opposite of what Paul had studied under Gamaliel. Because they understood in his day that all Israel would be saved and then God would save the nations. So that's the flip-flop and the great revelation that came from the Holy Spirit to Paul when he gets to Romans 11. And he says, hey, you know what? It's not going to be that way, the way we thought it was going to be. How often do we get the thought that we have it figured out? So what happened? <laughs> that's, another, that's another sermon in it. All right. Um, but here's the thing. In the early days, in the early 19th century, uh, people like William Wilberforce, whose picture was up there today, uh, and others began to read the scriptures, and Romans 9, 10, and 11 came into place, and the evangelicals who were reading the Bible said, hey, wait a minute, God's not finished with the Jewish people. What was their great debate? Charles Simeon and a few others. They were reading the Ezekiel and the dry bones and all that stuff, and they were saying, wait a minute, God's going to bring his people back to the land. Now, the question they had was, this was, look, what was today? What is today Israel was uh, the vast uh, dry land of the Ottoman Empire for 400 years. So they had they were going completely on what the word said, and, it, and they said, "Here's the deal: either God's going to bring His people back to the land, and then pour the Spirit out on them, or He's going to pour the Spirit out on them and then bring them back to the land. It's got to be one way or the other." And they, they just were speculating on that, and based on the dry bones piece of uh, Ezekiel. Um, he, they decided that, well, probably they will go back to the land and then the spirit will fall back on them because remember the dry bones are there and then it's not until they're put back together that the spirit breathes on them. So they were going by that. So William Wilberforce, the Lord Shaftesbury that I mentioned, uh, they, they formed what became, a, a, what they were calling in those days, a restorationist movement. They were saying the Jews are going back to their land. We're going to help them go back to the land. That's another whole history I could spend the rest of the day talking to you about. So for 210 years, CMJ has been taking the gospel to the Jewish people. It's the oldest mission to the Jews since the book of Acts. And Christ Church in Jerusalem is the oldest Anglican church in the Middle East, uh, which is our headquarters today and which is where we were just staying last week. Now I'm going to finish with this one story. There's a famous uh, story told uh, by uh, about Charles Simeon. He gave about 19 of the first 20 annual uh, meeting speeches at our CMJ conferences when we started in 1809, after we started in 1809. Um, and uh, he was preaching one day at one of these annual dinners, and the founder, the president then of, of CMS, Church Mission Society, was in the audience. And um, Simeon talked about the primacy and the priority of Jewish mission. And, and, and uh, the, the guy that was president of CMS wrote a note, and he said, Charles Simeon, uh, and they were estimating there were about 8 million Jews. They didn't know really because we didn't have population stuff then. But he says, if 8 million Jews, what about the 800 million heathens? Charles Simeon turned the paper over, and he wrote on the back, yes, but what if... The 8 million is the key to the 800 million. What was he basing that on? Romans 1.16. I am not the sh ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of salvation to all those who believe to the Jew first. Okay. So if the church lost the key to the priority of Jewish mission and Jewish evangelism, why are we still having 2 billion people who don't know the name of Jesus? That was his question. And I think that's something we really, CMJ has been bringing that to the church year after year after year because we have neglected. Now, the good news, and I'm just going to finish with this, the good news is that when I started going to Israel in 1976, we had maybe two Messianic congregations. 
Now that's not so terribly long ago. I mean, in in the vast uh, you know array of world history, but today we have well over 150 messianic congregations. Now missiologists would tell you that until a people group reaches the famous two percent of 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 believers within their people group, that group can't self-propagate, can't plant its own. We are just about to that point among Jews of Jewish, uh, in Jewish evangelism. Uh, it has astounded me to watch what we have seen in the last 30 years. Uh, more, when we heard the statistic that more people have been coming to faith, and then he put that 44 million, you know, that are being born every day or something. Anyway, uh, but the Jews don't populate quite that much. And so we're getting a little closer. We, gotta, we stand up. Our percentages are, are looking much better than that general statistic. And, and thank God for it. But I really, uh, I know for a fact, as I've watched these 40 years go by in Israel, you know, Isaiah and Micah wrote, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And today, Israel is starting to send out their own missionaries. Uh, I had a call one day a few years ago when I was, uh, had a group over in Israel, and I got a call from one of our, our centers up on the Galilee uh, in Migdal, and uh, they said, hey, we've got a group of uh, 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 Ugandans here, and uh, they've run out of money, and they, need to, they really want to see some of the sites up here, you know, where Jesus ministered. Do you have any room on your bus? And I said, oh, sure, we'll come up there. So we came up, and we picked them up. Well, I had prayed for years for somebody to reach the Druze. Now, the Druze are this little group that live up in the mountains, you know, of Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. And, uh, and they, they are very kind of secret religion, and they broke away from Islam back in the 11th century. And, uh, and they're so uh, in, encased with themselves, you know. I mean, it was just like, who's going to reach this group? Because they're just like in this very enclosed places, uh, in their little secret religion places. So this, I get to Migdal, and, the, and I knew some of these Ugandans. Some of them were our bishops and stuff, and they got on the bus, but with them was this guy. And I said, I had never met him before. I said, oh, who are you? And he says, well, I'm kind of the leader of this group. And I said, well, here, I handed him the microphone on the bus, and I said, tell us your story. And he said, well, this is where he started. I'm a Druze. <laughs> Been praying for this. And he tells, his, he tells his testimony of how he had gone into the Israeli army because Druze serve in the army wherever they are, if they, they're able to do that. So he had gone in the army, and he met the Lord, Jesus. Amen. And, and he, was going, he was a missionary going out to Uganda. That's how he knew all these Ugandans. <laughs> all right. Way to go, you know. So I could tell you a lot of those kind of stories. So. I think my 15 minutes of a TED talk is about up, but I'm ready for a question and answer now. So praise Jesus. All right. Oh, I, last thing. See that line, that last line on your outline. The question is, if God is not faithful to his promises to Abraham and his descendants, why would I think he is faithful to his promise to us Jesus believers? Okay. Okay. D-R-U-Z-E, Druze, interesting group. Question. Thank you uh, for the talk. Um, what, I understand the concept of the land, but what about the Dome of the Rock and the control of the dome? What about the Dome of the Rock? That's such a great question. Well, back in, I think uh, David Ben-Gurion made two major mistakes. I mean, he made a lot of really good decisions. But one of them was that uh, they would give the Temple Mount, what we would call for the Jews the Temple Mount, uh, uh, to the control of uh, the Islamic Council. And, uh, of course, the Dome of the Rock's been sitting there since the 7th century, okay? And uh, then the Aqsa Mosque, which is also sitting on the, on the Temple Mount, yeah, was built later. Um, and so there's a long history there. And so I think this, the thought was, okay, that sits there. Uh, ben Gurion and Golda Meir and the, the group of Eastern European Jews were secular uh, uh, and mainly sort of socialist, and they just really weren't that taken with. The, they just 
there it is. It's there. We, we don't need it. You know, it's there. So, so it stayed. And then, of course, it was under Jordanian hands from 1948 when Israel became a state until the War of 1967, the Six-Day War, um, when all of the old city, including our Christ Church, being in the old city, uh, came back under Jewish rule. So there it sits. I don't know what to say more than that, but it is there. Except to say this, when I was in Israel just like last week uh, in Jerusalem, uh, I had been hearing rumors for about 40 years that there was a group of there were there was a group of ultra orthodox Jews, uh, Jewish uh, uh, religious folks, who have been planning to rebuild the temple. Some of you probably heard this, okay? And I'd heard that though they're looking for the red heifer. I did a little teaching on the red heifer. Uh, Everybody's favorite chapter, Numbers 19, you know. Uh, and see, I told you you should be reading Torah. So, um, uh, but, but, you know, they were putting all these things together. They were, they were uh, talking about blood sacrifice again. They were measuring the, what's, they were looking at the size of the menorah that was supposed to be in the holy place. They were uh, talking about how do you make the showbread. They were talking about priestly garments. So when I was there this time, uh, they said, hey, have you been to the Temple Institute? Okay, and some people have been there probably. Um, and so I thought, hey, I'm, I'm just going to trot down there and see what that looks like. So I did. And uh, it is interesting. And they have all these things in there. So I don't know what's happening. Uh, some people talk about this is an earthquake zone. Now, what did we hear? Every time I go back to Israel, every year I'm in Israel, and they say, oh, we're really overdue for that big one. You know? <laughs> well, it's true because they said every 93 years... 93, not, not 90, not 100, you know, 93 years. When is 93 years? Oh, that's like next year. Okay, stay tuned. You know, as we say in Hebrew, I'll, I need lo yodad. I do not know. Yes, there's a controversy. Yeah, there's... Yes, yes, there's, you know, we, but there's a lot of, con she's bringing up a, a very real thing. There's a lot of controversy. Where was the temple anyway? Where was, you know, Arana's fl floor, you know, the threshing floor that David brought? Yes. I'm wondering about your opinion on the uh, latest annexation efforts. Oh, the latest annexation efforts. Boy, we're really going to get into this. This is almost as bad as just, um, well, there, uh, I can only say that there, obviously, that's a mixed opinion on what it is. But I don't know if any of you, if you look at the map of Israel, I can just say this much. If you look at the map of Israel, now, whether that's going to happen or not, I'm not sure. But when he talked about annexing the Jordan Valley, uh, there are seven cities in the, what, quote, West Bank uh, that are under Palestinian authority. None of those cities like Hebron, Bethlehem, Nablus, et cetera, are in the, the, the Jordan Valley, that area that he's talking about. Now, under the agreements, Israel always held on to the one road, and we were on it. Um, anybody that's been to Israel will most likely drive on that road that connects approximately from Jericho up to Bet Shan, up the Jordan Valley. So that's the part he's talking about, and there are no major cities in that area under Palestinian authority. If it happens, I don't know. You know, it's politics, and there's an election there, and there's an election here, so, so be it. We did go to the American embassy just to take some pictures of that plaque in Jerusalem. Yes? My opinion is that we aren't. <laughs> Uh, there, is no, there is no place in the Bible that uses the phrase, in the New Testament, Old Testament, anywhere, that uses the phrase New Testament. I mean, New Israel. The New Israel. Okay, but then you have to get into Pauline theology about we are sons of Abraham by faith. And what does the one olive tree that Paul talks about in Romans 11, they're not two olive trees, Gentile and Jewish. The roots are Jewish. We're grafted in. We're the wild olive trees. We're just lucky to be there, honey. Pardon me? He can take us. He can take anybody out if we don't have faith. He says that, Jew or Gentile. But he also says, 
the, he's saying to the Gentiles in the Roman church, uh, the root, you don't support the root, the root supports you. Don't get so arrogant. That's, his, that's Paul's words. Okay, so the word new Israel is not in the, in, in the New Testament. That sometimes people will look at, at uh, Galatians where it says, uh, when he talks about both the, both the uh, speaking of both the Jews and the Gentiles who are in faith, being uh, kind of put together. Uh, and then Paul talks in Ephesians about the p wall of partition coming down. But I would contend, uh, working with our Messianic Jewish believers, uh, that the, the distinctives of Jew and Gentile have not been broken down. Even though we come to faith in Jesus in one, G one we're all in that olive tree together. You know, because it, I, I think I can see from Scripture that, that there's a, a distinctive of place for the Jews as Jews coming in. So I, I don't know how that's going to play out either. I've watched the Messianic uh, movement from its almost its modern beginning, you know, uh, in the 70s. So we'll see how that goes. But the main thing is that we're taking the gospel to the Jews and they're coming to faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's the anguish of the Jews by Flannery, Edward, Edward, Edward Flannery, published by Paulus Press, 1985. Um, okay, well, it's in my footnotes. Um, uh, I mean, you just, now, look, there are whole books. I've got whole books. I've got Chrysostom and the Jews. I mean, look, you could just read yourself, you know, till we all die. Seriously, because this has been a serious thing with the church. And honestly, the, the, the patristics, now we, we make a lot, we say the Nicene Creed, right, all the time. And we like Nicaea. We like to talk about Nicaea Council, you know, 325 and all this stuff. But do you know that none of the bishops in the church who had Jewish backgrounds were invited to, that, to the Nicene Council? Nobody knows that. Do you think you're going to read that in the, because you know why? The victors write the history. And the church, the Gentile church, became the, quote, victors. So the Jews got written out of, of, from early on. I didn't even tell you about Marcion. I mean, he's only 160 A.D., you know. And what did he say? The God of the Old Testament, that Yahweh God, is a pitiful, horrible guy. I mean, he's war killing, you know, what is that guy? He can't possibly be the father of Jesus Christ. So what does he have to conclude? Follow that logic. First of all, he cut out the whole, you know, Old Testament. Uh, and he cut out a whole bunch of the New Testament, by the way. Um, but, um, but what he basically said was, okay, if Yahweh is not the father of Jesus Christ, who is all love, after all, um, then who's... Who is this Yahweh that we hear about? So he decides he's a demiurge, he's an evil god, he's a pagan god, and those who worships that god? The Jews. If they're worshiping that god, they must be evil. Now that started in the, that was the second century. Now, Marcion was condemned by the church officially, whatever the church looked like in, you know, 160 A.D., um, but his ideas and churches that were built, Marcion churches, were all over the Middle East for years. And that, that listen, heresies stay in for a long time, and they keep popping up in all kind of different forms. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you hear what he just said? Now, it's very interesting because, you know, the Church of Canada, God bless them, um, at one time had some of the most beautiful hymns, even, and prayers for the J salvation of the Jewish people. I have some of them in my files. But 
Eastern Orthodox. Well, it doesn't matter whether he's Eastern Orthodox or Anglican or whatever he is. The fact that he's praying, yeah, that to say something nice about it. But see, that's where the, I'm sorry, that's where the liberal church has gone, you know, because why? Well, we can get, that's another whole topic of, <laughs> of you know, well, because, yeah, yes. I have a question. Uh, politics today, there's a lot of people anti-Semitism, and you hear it over and over again. I just wanted to know, what do the people in Israel think about that? Because a lot of people around the world... <laughs> Yes, he's bringing up the topic of of the increase, the tremendous increase, and I have statistics on that. I mean, in the hundreds of percentages more of anti-Semitic incidences uh, in all over, West, especially in the West, Europe, but United States, even in your own communities and in some of our larger cities, uh, it, it ties in in the United States with the BDS movement, uh, that's boycott, sanctions, and divestment of Israel products, et cetera, et cetera. And his, your question was, how do the people in Israel feel about that? They're glad to be in Israel. They're very aware of what's happening. And more, listen, we are now translating things now. In, we did a lot of translation into Russian because 100,000 Russians, when the wall came down at the end of the, in 1989 and then 90, early 90s, 100,000 Russian Jews came into Israel and got free, uh, free Soviet juries. I marched in those marches in Washington, D.C. in the 80s. Um, and, and so we started publishing a lot of stuff in Russian. Then we had 20 Russian-speaking Messianic congregations in Israel. Um, uh, but now we're publishing in French, because why? France had the largest Jewish population in Europe. It had the largest Muslim population in Europe. And so... The, the, you've, you've all read the newspaper, the, the anti-Semitic killings, uh, murders, the intimidation, uh, Germany saying don't wear your kippah uh, in public, don't wear your Star of David in public because it's too dangerous. Um, it, it's building. It's 1938 again. I say that all the time. It's not, at least 1938. Uh, wait, I got one. Oh. Uh, I think it's time for us to move to the other room because the next group, have, the next room is the w room on the other side of that wall. Okay, so if you want to talk some more, feel free to come over.